All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, to an interview with Nathan Moody. Uh, I am Christoph, also known as Monocene. I'm here with Sign Mountain, David Soto, and we are from the Colorado Modulus in Society. And we are talking to Nathan Moody today about mastering. Hi, Nathan. Hey, how's it going? Good. Thanks for joining us. Thank um, you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an interesting topic, mastering. So I think that a lot of people wonder, like much like I did uh, when I first got started, what the heck is mastering? How would you, how would you explain that to somebody who, who doesn't know what mastering is? Um, there's a contemporary answer and a historical answer. So the historical answer is that a mastering engineer is typically, has typically been the person to take what a mix engineer creates and fully prepares it for mechanical reproduction. So back in the day, of course, that basically just meant for vinyl. Uh, these days, it's much more, I think, about an objective third party evaluating your mixes and doing a final polish on processing to make sure that your work translates in the most appropriate way for the broadest, broadest audience possible. And uh, the difference there is, is kind of subtle on the one hand, but uh, what a lot of my clients ask me to do is to really figure out what is the emotional or narrative core of their work and how can we just tweak the final mixes just slightly to put the right um uh, the right emphasis on their work in terms of emotion vibe theme loudness and so for contemporary artists i think the value of mastering is really just objectivity it's another pair of ears in a different room with a different set of monitors. Uh, and hopefully that whole chain from the desk to the monitors to the room is less forgiving than what a mix engineer or even an artist might have in their own studio. So it's a bit more of an objective point of view. And um, so some people master their own work, which is great. But I think that the real benefit of mastering and why I, as a mastering engineer, have people master my own music who aren't me, uh, is really that final objective point of view to eliminate your the acoustics in your room as a variable and the acoustics in your monitoring setup as a variable to make sure that your work translates in the best way possible for the broadest set of listeners. Right. That's great. So since we're talking about uh, mastering and modular synths. What what is the what is the difference between mastering a modular synth album versus just uh, other an album with this instruments and stuff like that? Or, or is there is there a difference at all? That's a great question. I would I would actually argue there isn't a huge difference. Um, one thing that I find is that a lot of people tend to think that modular systems can create this huge dynamic range and they can. But what I think is more common is that modular systems create this real uh, frequency range from the infrasonic to the ultrasonic and everything in between. And so that's something that needs, um, that needs some special care and feeding. But you'd be surprised even VSTs and virtual synths, often in the code that makes these things possible, they often don't filter out like DC offset. So I've gotten a lot of VST-based electronic music where the loudest uh, peak in terms of frequencies is like below 20 hertz, which no one's ever going to hear. So even VSTs can have a lot of infrasonic content. Um, but I, I think with 
pure analog synthesis, one of the bigger risks is actually resonances. So um, people using resonant uh, filters, 20 dB per octave or uh, 24 dB per octave or higher in slope, uh, those tend to create these resonances where you might have your filter set at a certain point. And then when your note hits that same point, it might jump three to six dB in level. And so sometimes that does create a greater dynamic range in a way that doesn't really suit the music. You know, mm -hmm. like just because you hit a the C as opposed to the C sharp doesn't mean that's a crescendo in energy. It's just the note you happen to hit at that time, as opposed to like verse versus chorus, where the chorus does want to kind of often be lifted up a little bit in terms of energy or impact. So there are some some aspects to modular synthesis that one ha does have to kind of listen for, but uh, the difference between uh, modular music, traditional kind of rock arrangements or entirely virtual is actually, they're different, but the span is uh, pretty tight as opposed to pretty broad. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's. So, I think that's a. I think it's a good point to, to 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 make though about the difference in like frequency range and dynamics because I think that does get mixed up a lot where people think, oh my, my modular system is making sounds no other machine can make. Uh, it's got this crazy frequency range, but you're saying that you're seeing that and, and, and even in VST, so it's it's not. It's not the only thing. Yeah, I, a, a lot of it is a question more of arrangement than mixing. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people tend to think about, you know, I write, I mix, and I master. Well, you write, and then you arrange, then you mix, then you master. And, I'll, and you know, one of the greatest things about modular systems is that you can kind of do a lot of that maybe not strictly at the same time, but in just rapid succession in very small steps where you'll write a melody and then you'll kind of arrange it against some other voices and then you'll mix it in a sub mixer and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but still causing yourself to kind of slow down and step back and think of songwriting steps in terms of uh, writing arrangement slash sound design, mixing and mastering as separate processes, even if they're tightly interleaved moment to moment, thinking about those as separate, uh, separate steps along the path can be really helpful when you're starting to figure out, well, my track isn't quite working, why? And you can break it down and say, well, is it a mastering thing? I'll strip off everything off the master bus and see what that sounds like. Okay, well, all my mix levels are good. Oh, well, it's because I it's an arrangement problem because, for example, let's say that every fourth note of my bass line is the same pitch fundamental as my kick drum. So on the one and the three, all of a sudden, all the low end just spikes hugely. So then you make arrangement choices, like maybe the rhythmic delivery needs to change or you make a conscious decision that the kick drum is lower than the bass line. Or if you're doing dub, it's often the reverse, where the bass line is way lower than the kick drum. So, um, so when you start thinking about it in these more discrete steps, you can actually troubleshoot your own mixes, I think, in a much more effective way. I think that's a really good good way to approach it and that's something that I've learned um you know in the last few years to to really think about the end product you know the end in mind when I when I think about what 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 would it sound like in the end and then kind of walk back from there where where a certain you know when I get to a stage where you know I'm no mastering engineer but it, but, but when I when I try to apply uh, steps that I would say just to get it loud, it exposes things. So then go back one step to the to the mixing stage, like you say, and then back to the arrangement stage. That that's really a process that has helped me to identify issues that when I just listen to a patch, it usually sounds okay, right? But when I want to translate into something that sounds good, mastered, then that requires 
way different thinking. And I think that feedback loop has really helped me grow in, in making the choices in the arrangement early on versus getting to the mastering stage and then figuring out that I have to backtrack all the way down mm. and, and make fundamental changes again. So that's really, that's really an important thing to keep in mind because a, a great sounding patch does not always translate well, well in, my, in my experience for my own music into something that could be sounding good outside of my headphones in the moment when I'm mm. listening to it. Definitely. And I, and I think there's a, there's a big emotional component to all of these conversations, right? Because there's, there's the emotion and investment at the moment of creation. We are in a flow state. And the last thing you should do is interrupt that flow state with, is my phase correlation and the bass range okay? It's like, <laughs> don't worry about that. That can come later. Um, are, you, are you expressing what you need to express in the moment? And is that going to move people? That's always the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then being able, as, as you said, to then reflect on whatever comes out of that process and think about mixed translation, think about um, balance across the frequency range and, you know, in the dynamic range uh, in terms of volume, um, doing that after the creation process is, is done is really important. And that's why even... For me, when I'm in that flow state, I tend to be pretty anal about separating like creation versus editing versus mixing versus mastering into separate stages so that I don't have to like put on my mastering engineering hat when I'm really angry and trying to get something out on the keyboard. That is the last place I should be thinking about mix balance. I should be thinking about the emotion I'm trying to get into the piece. So how that... hard is that for you to take that hat off? Because it, it you know, in my in my experience, yeah. the more you know, the more you apply that at every stage. So do you have any? Uh, do you have any? You know, you obviously know the entire process from creation to mastering, which a lot of people, you know, it stops perhaps even at the mixing stage. But from your perspective, what's a good practical approach to to get to that stage where you say, okay, I'm not worrying about that right now. It's giving yourself time. It's, it's largely just time. So figure out what you want to express so that you have the intentionality behind what you're creating. And it's less blind stabbing in the dark and you've got something to actually say. Then once you've said it, it's just like writing. You know, people write, you know, page upon page upon page. And then in the editing process, that might get whittled down to one paragraph and i think music is something where that metaphor and that process is absolutely applicable and really important so i think that being able to create without boundaries or within boundaries if that makes you more creative is critical but then i think get that out sit with it and then revisit it later after some time has elapsed. It could be hours, could be days, could be weeks, could be months. Everyone's different. And then with that objectivity of hindsight, what you've done in the past and where it needs to go to be a complete presentable resolved piece is going to feel very different a few days after you create it rather than in the moment when you're trying to mix it and master it and shove it onto SoundCloud. So I would argue that rushing that process sometimes happens at one's own peril. Um, sometimes that speeding through that process is because you've just been hit by the lightning of inspiration and it's okay. So it's different for everybody. I think that's interesting that you say that, um, you know, listening to your own music, I know there's, there's sometimes a lot of textures and things that feel almost generative in some at some points, uh, but you're you're but you're still able to with from my what I'm understanding from you, you saying is like you're still intentionally making that decision to go into that direction to that soundscape, even if it's not structured like a pop tune or something. Absolutely, and uh, and I think that's why I'm so even as a mastering engineer, I'm so obsessed with artistic intent 
on the part of the artist. Because if you don't have intent, you have happenstance or you have randomness. And I think that, you know, we all use random randomness in our work because that's what makes it interesting. It makes it unpredictable in a, in a tasty way for the listener. But if it's, if you have a piece of work that is so random, there's no handles around your intent or what you mean or structure, it's just going to feel random and fewer people might engage with it. And it's certainly not about trying to make something that's popular or that reaches the most number of people, you know, art is not a popularity game or contest, but instead it's about how do, how does one as an artist best render what's inside of them in an aural way for a listener to then engage with and reflect back upon. And I think that's at the core of all music, whether it's noise or harsh noise or power noise or sweetly melodic ambient music or punk. And I think that that is what really is the, the creative core of what, whatever uh, an individual artist does. And as a mastering engineer, that's what I want to know because I want to be able to, you know, sharpen the spikes. If it's punk, I want to round off the, sh I want to round off the spikes. If it's beautiful pastoral ambient and knowing where that artist is coming from, if they can't, uh, if an artist can't express that verbally or through a mood board or whatever, vi you know, whatever communication method is useful to them, it's pretty hard as a mastering engineer to, to decide where to go. So I think one, one thing, um, I think this is all great, by the way. Thank you. Uh, what, one thing though, I'm thinking about is for, so some of us out there are still kind of new to recording in general. Maybe we weren't recording hmm. before and maybe like recording modular has already been kind of a challenge and we'll, you know, I think there's lots of talk about like, kind of mixers and how to, how to balance that. But I think one thing that, that comes to mind when you're talking about looking back at a piece and, and analyzing it and the arrangement part is really made me think about this, you know, are there tools besides my ear that I should possibly look at to help me to analyze what's going on in that, in, in that, in my sound, uh, should we be looking at these, you know, plugins is there something you know is, is an oscilloscope enough what do you recommend to kind of help aid some of that stuff that you can't see or hear i'm sorry that's a great question david thank you for bringing that up i would say there's probably two tools that as an artist mixer and mastering engineer i've found invaluable and kind of must-haves for me the first is a real-time frequency analyzer and that just lets you see a map of what frequencies are the loudest at a certain point in time. Uh, some oscilloscopes like uh, the O-Tool Plus, I think has one. The Mordax may do this. Uh, the Mordax Data, sorry, may do this. Um, but of course, it's often cheaper, faster, and more accurate to use that as a plugin. Uh, so if you're recording to your computer, you can always just have a real-time frequency analyzer on your master bus. And that way you can just even sometimes see the frequencies you can't hear. So in this room on my mastering mains, I hear down to 26 Hertz, but most home studios, you know, even if you have nice Genelex, chances are they're only this big, you're not gonna hear below 60 Hertz. So you're not gonna be able to, for example, assess whether or not you've got a huge infrasonic buildup where the loudest frequencies are actually at 12 Hertz, which no one in the, at the end of the day will ever hear. And it might be consuming headroom. And if you just high pass filter all that stuff out, you all of a sudden may have all this headroom and you can get your track a lot louder without clipping. So real time frequency analyzers, I think are really critical for the adventurous among us. I would also recommend a, uh, phase correlation meter. And 
Uh, there's a bunch of really good free ones from companies like Voxengo, V-O-X-E-N-G-O. I have no affiliation with that company, but uh, they have a really good RTA, real-time analyzer, plus correlation meter called SPAN. Uh, but they also have one called Correlometer, which is uh, phase correlation by frequency band. So you can see, oh, my bass notes are all completely decorrelated. That'll never get cut to vinyl because the cutting head or the playback head will skip out of the groove because it's too narrow. Or you can see that, oh, you know, everything is generally kind of positive in the correlation meter and that's fine. Or you might even say like, wow, the correlation meter is almost reading like completely mono. I have opportunity to make my mix much wider and more enveloping and more immersive. So the phase correlation meter basically just says, how wide is your signal at certain frequency bands? Um, and that has certain technical uh, implications downstream, for, uh, very much for what I do as a mastering engineer. But I would say the real-time frequency analyzer is far and away my number one suggestion for people who want to work with their eyes to better train their ears uh, over, over their musical careers. So the, the, the phase issues are, are an interesting topic because, um, you know, when I, when I was working with you, you recommended that I, w I was using span and I got the average uh, phase correlation, right? And I saw that wiggle around, but that correlometer was really insightful to see which frequency band was contributing to that. Mm. So now I look at that all the time and I don't know. I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's wrong with my stuff. <laughs> it's another example where, you know, knowing more. Is join not join the club. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just, I mean, you know, just at a, at a high level, th there's, you know, I see, I understand what it means, you know, when that, when a correlometer bounces around, but what is, when should I be worried about those things? Gotcha. That's a great question. So I just had a client the other day who got one of the wrong electronics uh, modules that matrixes left, right stereo into mid side stereo. And it can get you into not just wide, not just crazy wide. It can get you into stupid wide in terms of uh, stereo width and on headphones Oh my God, it sounds bizarre and super cool. The problem is an irony actually, is that now in 2021, we have more mono playback devices than we had 20 years ago because of Bluetooth speakers and smart home speakers and stuff like that. Those are almost all mono. Even the Apple HomePod has multiple speakers, but they're almost coincident in terms of where they are in physical space. Like the speakers are super tightly packed. So the issue with having negative phase is that uh, if you have certain frequencies that are in anti-phase, they're 180 degrees out of phase between the left and the right channels. When you go in mono, then those frequencies will cancel, will phase cancel each other out and they will either radically attenuate or drive completely to silence. And I was working just a couple of weeks ago on a kind of power noise industrial track where when I hit the mono button on my uh, controller, on my mastering desk out, out of frame here, all of the drums disappeared. They muted all of them. And it's like, this is an industrial dance track. <laughs> I'm pretty sure <laughs> in mono, we still need some like kick at least. So I talked to the artist. And uh, the artist was like, it's phase. I, I'm an artist. I don't know about phase. And from my standpoint, it's like, you shouldn't have to most of the time. You know, like I, my job is not to turn other people into audio engineers. My job is to be the engineer so other people can just create and do wacky, cool stuff. Um, but this was a case where the rest of the mix was solid, but the drums went into this wrong electronics module and just got matrixed into mid side in a way that was utterly incompatible with mono. So we just had him rein in the width 
of his drums and everything was great. The other issue with phase correlation is that if you have sustained negative phase correlation, a phase correlation meter goes from plus one to zero to minus one. So if your tracks dip below zero and go negative sometimes, that's okay. That's how reverbs work, for example, or stereo delays like that happens. It's fine. But if it's sustained negative, that gets you into a place, especially say 250 Hertz and, and lower where your material cannot be cut to vinyl because either the cutting head will skip because the groove gets too narrow or the, or even if it's cuttable, the playback head will often skip because the stylus is fatter than what's used on the cutting head. So, um, so phase is a big, big deal with mono compatibility, very big deal with vinyl cutting capability. And, uh, it actually makes a lot of people queasy. Um, I've, I've actually, it's like getting bee stings where you get more bee stings over time. You get more sensitive to getting stung by bees. Um, I've gotten crazy sensitive to negative phase where I, it will give me headaches and I feel like I want to throw up. And that's actually not just me. A lot of people feel that way when they're listening, especially on headphones. So all things that, you know, aren't complete deal killers or mix killers, but you should just know that these things exist and these psychoacoustic effects exist and because it's physics and uh, just something to always keep an eye and ear on. And uh, if you don't know how to fix it, you can talk to a mastering or mix engineer and they can help you address it. So is there, is there a way to kind of possibly, I mean, you mentioned that that module to like, to add width, is that, is that usually like the main culprit is like, there's something trying to like make things wider or, or reverb, or is there something that people could do? And, and I'm thinking spe specifically a modular that we can uh, kind of watch out so we don't get into that, into that weird. So my, thing. the first module that did that for me was the IntelliGel Azimuth. And as soon as I got rid of that thing, it was just like, I have no phase problems anymore. Um, the, uh, a really, really good tip. And I think that a lot of people in modular think about filters, low pass filters and high pass filters as, as voice shaping modules that happen pretty early in the signal chain, you know, like after the VCO, maybe before or after the VCA, but no later. And one of the things that's really useful is to high pass filter your reverb returns or your delay returns. And so that way you can have the high, higher frequency, mid or higher frequencies in your reverbs or delays nice and wide and it's spacious and bizarre and surreal, which is what we all want. But you're attenuating the lower frequencies that cause a lot of phase smearing and phase decorrelation. So on the unit behind me, my clouds, for example, goes left and right into dual 4HP um, simple EQs from um, Music Thing. And I use that just to roll off the low end of the return. I, I use a WMD performance mixer. So clouds is always on ascend. So on the return, I just sculpt out that low end in the return and it just like cleans up phase like you wouldn't believe um if anyone also uh actually the wrong uh mid side left right matrix module i mentioned you can use it the other way you can send clouds into that turn it into mid side and then you can potentially just high pass only the side channel not the mid and it does basically the same thing so mid side processing is just a different way of describing instead of left and right, you have the middle of the stereo image and everything on the side of the stereo image. Um, so with matrixing uh, apps or plugins or modules like that, you actually have a lot of control over width across specific uh, frequency ranges. Okay. That's good. That's good. I know like personally, I use the EQ into reverb to try to try to stop that but it seems like it makes sense to like obviously do that after the reverb yep but going uh doing it going in is totally not wrong either that's a totally legit method and if anyone's ever used like valhalla dsp 
filters, or, uh, sorry, uh, reverbs, they always, every single one has a high and low pass EQ setting in it. And this is exactly why. Like in the real world, no reverb, no reverberation in the real world is ever brighter than the source. Which is why I think a lot of us love shimmer reverbs, because it is, it's pitch shifted up. And it has this very unnatural, angelic, beautiful sound. But in the real world, that never happens. It's all the, the returns or reverberations are always darker than the source. Um, and in the real world, unfortunately, those lows do wind up getting really muddy and getting really phase decorrelated, which is why that um, that high pass filter in most reverb plugins exists. And Christoph, this is making me think about like when you have a bad seat at Red Rocks and you, and you start to get that that weird like bouncing off of the uh yeah. the, the rocks and then it just becomes yeah, this mud. And yeah, it's just kinda of not great. Um <laughs> that's a little Colorado uh not the Colorado <laughs> Totally. Uh, I mean that's that's a true. legendary it's a legendary uh venue though. And it that's true of every venue. Every venue you're gonna get some weird place where you're gonna sit at like a a node of the resonant frequencies of the room or the space you're in, and it's either going to radically accentuate uh frequencies or radically null them out. And actually that's one of the reasons why I'm a mastering engineer is that most of us work in residential spaces. And our rooms are lying to us every day, just like that amphitheater example you gave. And, you know, unless you have, as you can see in my studio, all these panels everywhere, unless you really acoustically treat your room, your, you might have the truest monitors in the world, but they're going to lie to you if your room isn't right. Mm -hmm. And getting a room right is a big investment in time and money. And I would rather have my clients spend their time and money making amazing music rather than getting nerdy like I do and tweaking out your room. If you, if you mix your own music from a mastering perspective, um, is there anything that people should look out for? You know, I don't have a set of good studio monitors, honestly. I, I mix with headphones. Is that some? Is there something to look out for there? Is there? Is that something that you know? There is these the the IR plugins that can simulate you know certain things in inside of your headphones. Do you recommend something like that for somebody to get started? Even you know that's usually the problem, right? People get started, they want to do something, and they're they're perhaps um, you know ready to go and work with you as a ma as a mastering engineer but they want to mix their own music is there is there anything that people should look should look out for in that in that regard excellent question i find that 9 times out of 10 people try to get their mixes just super loud and they're just not monitoring loud enough so if you want your mix 3 db louder make sure you have 3 db of 3 db of headroom in your mix and just crank up your monitor gain on your headphones. Like, that's not wrong, that's okay. Um, in terms of mastering your own work or, or creating what in the industry is called hot mixes, where it's not fully mastered, but it's kind of halfway between a mix and a master. It's certainly hotter, there's some dynamic uh, range reduction, hopefully in a tasteful way. My My recommendation is like, don't even mess around with compressors. Just throw a limiter on it. Just put a limiter on it and make sure that its output threshold is at least half a dB below digital zero or minus, minus 0 0.5 dBFS, decibels full scale. And that will do a few things. That will let you push into the limiter to get the gain of your mix hotter but by leaving half a decibel or even a full decibel, frankly, of headroom, when it's converted back into MP3, for example, on SoundCloud or YouTube or Instagram, it won't clip because you have this, this uh, thing called intersample peaks where uh, the MP3 codec, when it decodes and you're listening to the result, 
sometimes in between samples, a waveform will be interpolated and it'll actually peak above zero decibels full scale and it'll create a, a digital clip, which none of us ever want. So if you, you push your stuff into a brick wall limiter like uh, FabFilter Pro L or DMG Limitless or Waves L2, then that's probably the, the most kind of foolproof way of getting your mixes hotter um, and giving you at least a little bit of control and still having a, a, an output ceiling that isn't purely at zero. You can pull it down from zero to make sure that your MP3s don't, don't clip. And I know that as a mastering engineer, I know that uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify less so, but uh, Instagram for sure, they all like having one decibel of headroom from whatever you post. So if your output ceiling is minus one decibel full scale or minus one dBFS, um, that's gonna that's gonna be pretty safe, I think. Okay. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that's what was going on back there. I think like it's funny because I maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. And someone can correct me, but I don't really. Is there a is there a limiter in Euro rack. I know there's compressors, mm. uh, but I don't know if I've seen a limiter or is there something I can use that can act like a limiter for, for some of us mm. in this in the, with small, with small rigs. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where I would, uh, this is where we get back into the discussion we were having earlier about writing, arranging, mixing and mastering. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think a lot of people lose track of is that we're in the era of 24 or even 32 bit recording. So the whole idea of like recording as hot as possible is immaterial. It doesn't matter anymore. End of story. It just doesn't matter. In the days of 16 bit, in the days of tape, we were trying to overcome noise floor. Or we were trying to maximize a limited bit depth to achieve a certain dynamic range. That doesn't exist anymore. We don't have to worry about it anymore. So I've commercially mastered mixes that come to me that are like at minus 12 decibels full scale. They're at like minus 12 on my master, uh, on my master bus. And it's fine. They gain up just fine. There's not a lot of noise. It's, it's okay. So in that situation, what I would always recommend is if you're recording straight out of the modular, give yourself a ton of headroom, minus three, minus six from your absolute loudest peaks and then master them up using a limiter or someone like me or Lander or whatever you want to use, master it up to a more kind of commercial release level rather than trying to get at that level from the raw recording. Because if you do start to clip, you can never get that stuff back. Even if you can kind of hide it with, you know, Isotope RX advanced, the data is gone. It doesn't exist. You've just clipped. Um, another trick is that there's a whole class of plugin in the computer called soft clippers, which emulate what I do as a mastering engineer, which is actually pushing your A, a to D converter hard. And you should never try this with an interface. It won't work. But if you have like a AD converter with like 24 decibels of headroom, you can actually push it into the red and it will soft clip the transients, which sometimes can sound more transparent than a limiter. And one of the big things I've learned as a mastering engineer is you can stack these things doing small amounts uh, in series. And that often sounds better than one limiter trying to pull transients down by six dB. You could soft clip first, then push it into a limiter. You could compress it and then soft clip it clip it and then push it into a limiter. And at that point you get into mastering and it's a matter of what sounds best for the emotional response you're trying to get out of a listener. And that's a little bit of a different lens than just getting a mix loud. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, like getting a mix loud is, is useful, especially just for people to evaluate it, comparing it to other tracks from other artists. But I think mastering is really about that objective, uh, that objective point of view saying, is this maximized 
for the emotional impact and artistic intent someone is bringing to their music. And if you can do that yourself, um, that's awesome. I find that often just takes time. You know, I when I do have to master my own work due to budget, for example, at least a couple of months have to go by between when I'm finished my mixes and when I master. Otherwise, I have I don't have the objectivity to do it right. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I think um, I was watching that video when you were breaking down how you did Heimbox uh, album. And I remember like one thing that stuck out was like you said, I'm starting the day off first thing in the morning and I'm listening with fresh ears. And I just think like that's one of those things you kind of forget about. We were talking about speed, not being mm. always your friend. But I think that's that's interesting to kind of a like sl sleep on it and then start working on it with fresh ears. I, I like that. Uh, that. Uh, that tip or at least that that process. Yeah. Like even if you just want to like create a sketch and then throw it up on SoundCloud the next day. Like that's a legit workflow, no problem. But do it the next day. Just wait until the morning, listen back to it again, and just make sure that you're good with it going out in that state because ear fatigue, trust me, doing this every single day, ear fatigue is a very real thing. And you know, you hear differently at 7 p.m. or 10 p.m. than you do at 7 8 or 9 a.m and so that's always just a good sanity check for anything that you do just literally just give it some time i think that's super important especially considering that most people i know who patch patch for hours <laughs> they're sitting there totally <laughs> me too going. yeah yep yeah totally and, and and like you got it is it back to that 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 uh state of flow You've got to let that ride. You've got to ride that inspiration when it hits. And that is the last, you should not be thinking about mastering or even mixing at that point. You should be in full on expression mode and then just evaluate it the next day. And even if you have to like re-perform that patch again, mm -hmm. maybe that's, maybe that's what it needs instead of just trying to like really hammer hard on a performance that wasn't right. Maybe just do another performance and maybe you don't have to do anything at that point. I like that. This, uh, this, this, this talk about, uh, making things louder. I want to, I did get a very specific question for you. Uh, it says when mastering different genres of electronic music, do you target different loudness zones for different genres? For example, do you shoot for lower average loops for ambient music than more aggressive electronic music? That's a great question. Um, and you could ask that to five different mastering engineers. They're all going to give you a different answer. Um, so loudness units or LUs, um, often measured in LUFS, uh, loudness units full scale, just like decibels full scale is basically a measure of perceptual loudness based on the frequency curve of our actual human ears. It's an average because everyone's ears are different. Um, and that is something that we as mastering engineers follow a lot more than decibels or even, you know, RMS readings versus true peak readings uh, when it comes to decibels. And um, I, it's something that comes with experience. Um, I know just from experience, having listened to a ton of music, analyzed a ton of music, mastered, mastering a ton of music that like, there is that to me, I have these mental tears, like surgeon techno is like minus nine to minus seven LUFS. It's freaking loud. Um, ironically, um, like deathcore is actually kind of in the same range um, for loudness. Um, ambient might be minus 12 LUFS or minus 14. Uh, I had a fascinating project just last week where it was a neoclassical album, but with electronic percussion. And I was the second mastering engineer to work on it because the first mastering engineer heard the electronic percussion and mastered it with like house or techno aesthetics which isn't wrong. It's, it's a subjective decision. Um, but he clued into the 
percussion. And for the artist, it felt too loud, too abrasive, too forward. And so the artist then came to me to do a, a second pass on this and told me this happened. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to approach it more like classical, where it's a much broader dynamic range from quiet to loud. Some parts you're going to have to lean in a little bit, but we're not going to lead with like the 808 kick being like the ter determiner of loudness. And he was much happier with that kind of approach. So even when you have something, especially actually when you have something that straddles genres, mm -hmm. that's where you just have to make some of these decisions as to what aesthetic am I going for? And I've mastered ambient music crazy loud because it was meant to be emotionally intense. And so the artist asked for it to be louder. And I've mastered techno pretty quiet because the artist wanted like extreme dynamic range and expressivity, even though it was nominally techno. So over time you, and, and by listening to reference tracks, especially not on Spotify, because Spotify loudness normalizes anything, everything, and then it's useless. But if you start uh, comparing and measuring MP3s or WAV files to your own work, then you can start to get a sense of like, oh, here's a good target range for an artist that I feel some affinity towards. And that's a good way to start figuring out like what loudness pocket should I be in? And that's a lot of what I do. And I've just done it enough that it's kind of intrinsic knowledge now. And a lot of it's me just asking questions about feel and vibe. You know, I, the last thing I want to do is ask a client like, what LUFS do you want this specifically to be at? Um, but, you know, if they say, I want it to feel open. I want it to feel warm and enveloping. Probably don't want to push it that hard. If they say intense, visceral, probably want to push it a little harder. So I wind up working much more from uh, emotional cues and then referencing that to the body of work I've done in the past to try to find the right level. And I'm not always right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I, I definitely learned something from that. I didn't know what those were, honestly. I was. <laughs> there's, a, there's a thing called the Fletcher Munson curve, and it's basically a model for how the average human auditory system, um, it's basically a model for the human auditory system's frequency response. And come to find out, most of us are really, really sensitive to surprise evolution where human speech usually lives, you know, mm -hmm. like 1K to 4K mm -hmm. is kind of where we're really sensitive. So if you want to mix something or arrange something that is going to be perceptually loud, that's where you want to really push frequency okay. content. Okay. Um, whereas, you know, I'm, I'm working on a track right now where like the, the peak levels of stuff, like in the kick drums are out of control loud. But the overall loudness rating, the LUFS, is pretty low because it's kind of a scooped out in the mids kind of tone. So without a lot of sustained one to four kilohertz tones, it's going to read on the meters as perceptually quiet. So when you start paying attention to loudness and you know what, what's going to trip up the meters, you might be like, to my ears, it actually sounds different than what the meters are telling me in terms of loudness, because you know where the meters are especially sensitive. And that just comes with experience. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you can't just fly by instrument alone. <laughs> you know, mm. you gotta... the, the first time I listened to anyone's work submitted to me as a mastering engineer, all the meters are turned off, all of them. And I sit there and I have a little notebook and I write down my impressions. And, and I literally just take guesses as to where I think the problems are. And then on a second listen, I turn all the meters back on and I validate my assumptions. So that way I'm constantly training my ears, but also relying on the meters to tell me things that I might've missed. And you know, you should always leave with your ears, not your eyes. Um, and that's a good way to kind of start training your ears just to like, you know, make notes and say like, you know, what frequencies seem kind of pokey or stabby or strident and then you can validate that with meters in a in a 
uh, successive pass. That's a good one. That's a good piece of advice. I feel like there might be some people watching who are just getting interested in mastering. Maybe this is bringing them into mastering or, or at least more, you know, getting more into engineering uh, in some way, mixing or whatever. Um, so I think like th those are good tips to kind of pass along to people getting started. Like that's a good process. I like that. Definitely. I would say in terms of process, don't record too hot. Record with healthy headroom. Make sure that your peaks aren't higher than 6 dB full scale, we'll say, on your meters. Um, definitely give yourself some time between recording and then finalizing the mix. If you have a mix, maybe it's, you know, like I often do, straight out of the modular and it's stereo, and then that's the mix. Give yourself some time between the mix and mastering, just so you have some objectivity. And use a lot of reference tracks. Listen to what other people are doing in MP3 or WAV format. Um, and this is where Bandcamp is amazing. You know, I will regularly go on Bandcamp, even for albums I already own, and I will buy or download the WAV file versions instead of the MP3 versions, and or FLAC even. And then you can hear it completely uncompressed, mm -hmm. right, basically right out of the mastering engineer's desk. And that can be really enlightening. And you just have to remember that when you use reference mixes, you always have to pull them down to make sure that you're kind of level matching where your mix is perceptually and where this reference mix is. Because your reference mixes are already mastered, they're already released, and you might be comparing your kind of rough mix to it. And if you're comparing master to mix, you need to bring that master way down to make sure that it's perceptually around the same loudness. If you're trying to compare master to master, then that's a little bit easier. Question on, on back on process. Well, how do you, how is, how do you know when you, you've completed a, a like you're, you've mastered a project, you're done. It seems like a problem oh, that people yeah. have. Like, it's already a problem to have, like, when do I stop? And I think this is ready to send over to Nathan. That's already a problem. And yeah. then you get it, and then, then you, you get to have that fun quandary. Whew. That is the million-dollar question, David. Um, so I part of my background is I was an art major, so I went to art school. And we had a lot of conversations about this very topic, not about music, but about art in general. And we, we almost never use the term done. Nothing is ever done. And of course, like everyone's, I'm sure, familiar with the phrase, you know, no art is ever done. It's abandoned. And I think that's, I think that's really cynical. And I, I don't like that approach. Um, the, the phrase I always use is, is the piece resolved? Is it resolved enough to be shared with someone else and have them interpret the work on their own? So what I'm always testing for is resolution. Is a piece resolved? And I think a lot of that has to do with whether or not, you know, I have made the decisions I have to make to complete a piece. Or am I abdicating some of my responsibilities by saying like, I don't know, it's rings into clouds, it's fine. You know, it's like, uh, I, I would rather say like, if I'm putting rings into clouds, what am I saying? What function is that voice providing in my mix functionally or aesthetically or narratively and once i've got all that stuff resolved if i feel like anything else i change is just going to make it different but not better it's probably resolved and at that point i will either say it's done goes into my you know album folder and i'll master it in a couple of months or it goes to friends and family. And I say like, I think this is resolved. Would you let me, would you tell me what you think? And I think that's kind of where if you can't hire a mastering engineer, for example, like go to friends, go to family, go to housemates, go to significant others and just ask for their opinion. And just that tiny little, you know, if it's a five minute track, those five minutes will tell you more 
than an hour sitting in your own studio by yourself, hitting your head against the wall, trying to figure out what's wrong. Christoph, do you have any more questions for our good man, Nathan, about mastering? No, I think, uh, I think we can, uh, we can wrap this up. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Nathan, for, for joining us and talking to us about mastering. Um, if you want to, uh, just, uh, tell our viewers, um, you know, what your, the services you provide, what your, uh, what your business name is so they can find you. We'll put links and everything in the, in the show notes for this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can just, uh, give us some details. Sure. So, um, as a mastering engineer, I operate as Obsidian Sound, and you can find me at obsidiansound.net. Um, that has all my information and latest projects and rate sheet and all that good stuff. Um, as part of that service, I also offer mix reviews, uh, whether they're written or live in real time over Google Meet or Zoom. Um, and that can sometimes be a handy kind of middle ground between handing off a master that you're not maybe not sure about versus getting a really, really in-depth uh, review of your mix before you go to that process. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram pretty easily. I'm pretty active on both of those platforms. Awesome. Well, thanks so much yeah, thank for, you. for dropping so much knowledge about this. And we'll definitely, you know, come back to you uh, at some point again to keep talking about it because I think our audience is getting smarter and smarter and more savvy and things are changing and, and it would be great to catch up with you on state of mastery in the future here. Thank Absolutely. You. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a total joy. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for watching.